Good. So I see some new faces, met most of you, and, and uh, others that are confused wonder why in the world I'm up here today. Pastor George and his family are on vacation, well-deserved vacation, I might add. So, um, and I am like the kid in kickball, the last one to ever get picked. So his top 10, I was like the 11th out of 11 kids, right? So his top 10 wasn't available today, so here you're stuck with me. So that's just the way it goes. But it does remind me of a story that um, a, a pastor was done preaching one day, and he was standing at the back and greeting everyone as they left. And a little boy comes up, shakes his hand, and said, Preacher, when I grow up, I'm going to give you all the money that I've ever, I ever make. He goes, well, that's a, a kind gesture. Why would you do that, son? And he says, well, my daddy said you're the poorest preacher he's ever heard. So uh, hopefully that's not the case, uh, but glad you're here today and glad that you're online watching us. I know Pastor George is watching because he's already trying to control everything from Orlando. We got this, homie. Let us go, man. Just worship with us. All right. All right. It's good. Mark chapter 4 is where uh, we're going to be taking the text. So if you've got an old-fashioned Bible, as one of the kids said a couple weeks ago, or uh, YouVersion Bible app or Bible Gateway is another good one, uh, we just encourage you to get the Word of God in your hands. You can verify what I'm saying is the truth uh, as God presents it to us and, and uses me to do that this morning. So uh, I'm going to read our text and then we'll jump into uh, things that God has given me to share uh, with our church this morning. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 begins this way. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, said, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with, with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The title for a message today, if I could give one, is God's Got This. Can we say that together? God's Got This. I'm sure we all come with our sets of uh, things that bother us. We come and try to somehow turn off the switch of our troubles throughout the week, and we're coming to worship today. Uh, but I'd like to kind of start us off with an illustration. Uh, you're going to see a little Midwest flavor coming out in the message today. I'm just telling you, right? I'm a Midwest guy, so uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, that's why we're a diverse congregation. All, all tribes, tongues, and nations will be gathered around the throne. Um, an illustration that three guys left home, started careers, and prospered. And getting back together one day, they discussed gifts they were going to get their elderly mother for Christmas. The first brother said, I built a huge house for mom. She's always deserved something much nicer than the tiny house we grew up in. The second brother said, I bought her a Mercedes and hired a full-time driver for her so that she doesn't have to worry about getting around where she needs to go. The third brother smiled and said, I've got you both beat. You know how mom enjoys the Bible and you know how she can't see very well. I sent her a brown parrot that can recite the entire Bible. It took 20 monks in a monastery 12 years to teach him. I had to pledge to contribute $100,000 a year for 10 years, but it was worth it. Mom just has to name the chapter and the verse, and the parrot will recite it. Not long after Christmas was over, Mom sent out her cards of thanks. She wrote to the first son, Jack, the house you build is not practical. I only live in one room, but I have to heat, cool, and clean the entire house. But it was a nice thought. To the second son, she wrote, John, I am too old to travel. I stay at home all the time, so I never use the Mercedes, and the driver is so rude. But I do appreciate the thought. She wrote the third son, dearest David, you were the only son to have the good sense to know what your mother really likes. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> I share that illustration to say this. Sometimes things don't turn out the way we plan. Would we agree? 
even our best laid plans with all the logic and our expertise and experience, sometimes things don't turn out the way we plan. And certainly that is true in the kingdom of God as we serve God and we uh, live lives to bring him glory and honor. Or maybe more accurately, a lot of times life gives us unexpected events, circumstances, and seasons of life that can really turn life upside down on its head. Many times it brings us frustration. Oftentimes it brings us hardship. Sometimes it can bring us fear and anxiety. And fellas, you tough guys out there, I will tell you, there's things that uh, you can probably agree that happen. Sometimes it scares us to death. I have a favorite life passage I would like to share uh, by way of introduction. And I, if I remember right, it's one of John's favorites as well. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. As much as I would like to say that I'm a pretty logical guy that doesn't uh, seem to freak out and, and that I trust God no matter what the circumstances are and that I never get stressed or never get worried or I never get angry or I never get bitter at life, the fact is that sometimes my faith is weak and I don't give God the trust that he deserves. So what do we do when trouble comes? What is our reaction? And that's something that only you can answer. But, uh, but hopefully through the message, through the word of God and the truths that we find this morning, we'll find some things that will help us when those times come. Because let's agree this morning that those times, we know what they're like, we know what they're about, and there will be more to come if the Lord tarries. So what do we do when trouble comes? What do we do when our best laid plans fall apart? What do we do in the direction we're going isn't the direction that we thought God had in mind for us. Listen, the purpose of this message is not to give us answers to all of life's troubles or to beat us up in an area that I think we all have room to grow in. Someone say, I've got trouble. Okay, let's try it again. Everybody say, I've got trouble. Now, I don't know why the wives looked at their husbands, but that's another story. I'd like to share some truths from the, from the word this morning, some things that I think the Lord has given me in this passage that I think can help all of us, and some practical applications from the text that I believe will give us some guidance, help us to know who God is, because one thing that we uh, need to come to a conclusion on this morning is there will always be unanswered questions uh, that we may not get what, what answers we're looking for. We don't have to concentrate on what we don't know, but what we can find in this passage are things that we do know that we can rely on, the promises of God that we can go to when we have those difficult times. So four things I would like to give us, four truths that I believe the Lord has given me through this passage. The first one is God is powerful yet personal. If we notice in verse 35 it says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go to the other side. Now, let's establish something as we start the message this morning. There's a fundamental truth that we find in the Word of God that is not debatable if we're going to be a follower of Christ, and that is that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Can we say amen to that? Now, I may use interchangeably this morning Jesus and God and, and those things in our references. We pull out the details of the events and use them to illustrate God's character. We see from our text that Jesus not only demonstrated his power in calming the storm, he showed his power, but he was also, it also gave us insight to his humanity, the personal side of Jesus, because as soon as they launched over, what happened? What did he do? He went to sleep on the boat, right? So we see his power in drawing crowds. We see his humanity. He was extremely popular at this time. His point of status, he's probably a celebrity status if we were thinking of it in modern terms. He drew a lot of followers. He drew a lot of seekers wanting to see what this person was about, this Jesus who with his teaching like something they'd never heard before. But he was so popular that, uh, and the crowd was so big that we understand from the context that Jesus was probably standing up in a boat using it as a platform so that you know, they didn't have modern systems. Way. Thank you to our setup team this morning. Pastor George is gone this week. For the first time, I think we've set this up without him here. Hey, we're good, good job, right? But they didn't have this modern technology. And so he was up on this boat, and he was teaching, and 
and uh, and he had probably been teaching for a greater part of the day as we enter into our text. In the earlier part of this chapter, we see the parable of the sower. In verses 21 and 20 through 23, we see that he talks about the importance of being a light. In verses 24 and 25, he speaks on judging and being judged. And in verses 26 and through 32, he talks about the kingdom of God starting out as a little seed. They're sowing and reaping, and when the harvest comes, it can become something great. But he had been teaching all day long, so we can understand that at this time, our Lord was probably worn out, which is likely one reason that he went to sleep on the boat. Let me back up for just a second. And... um, And just say that our pastor, <laughs> there's a lot of things that our pastor does to get ready for a Sunday message, aside from his other responsibilities. I know from preaching that I give everything I've got, and I'm worn out. So I can't imagine our Lord doing this all day with crowds all around him and teaching and how worn out he must be. But he went to sleep on the boat. Now, let's not miss some important principles about Jesus or God both being personal and powerful at the same time. He is powerful enough, we see in this text, to draw crowds to him. But there was wisdom in his words and his teaching, powerful enough that people wanted to hear more about him and see who he was. But he directed them to pull away. And I don't want to miss some of these details. I think they're important. You can gloss over them if you're not careful. And I think they're important. But he, after teaching all day, he told those, his closest followers, I want you to go and I want you to go to the other side. Let's let's launch away from here. Get out of here. Let's go to the other side. He already had taught the crowds that day. And he would demonstrate power on the other side. On the other side, if you read in the next chapter, Jesus cast the demons out of a man that ran among the tombs that nobody could buy, nobody could cut himself with rocks, and he screamed, and he demonstrated his power to cast the demon. But somewhere between the teaching of the day and the power on the other side, in the middle of that lake, God had something personal that he wanted to teach those that were his closest followers. There was some personal learning that needs to happen. And by way of application, I want, I want to say this, and we'll, we'll close our first point. God, has the powerful, God is powerful enough to teach us collectively as a church and personal enough to teach us individually. And by the way, the first, the collective learning, is not a replacement for the personal learning. God is big enough to love the whole world, as John 3.16 says, but yet says, But whoever, he's big enough to love the whole world, but yet strong enough and personal enough to save each and every individual. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. He was powerful enough to be the creator of the world. The world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him, it says in, in John chapter 1. He came to his own, his own people, the nation Israel, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did. There's the personal part. He's the creator of the world, but yet he's powerful uh, to create the world, but personal enough to come to each and every one of us and say, I give you the right to become my child. You are an heir of everything that I have. God loves the world. He loves his church. And, And let's be encouraged this morning that he loves you and me individually. And that's a good promise to remember as we start to go through some of these times that are unique and personal and difficult for us. And let me say this as I close the first point. I would encourage you, if you're not already involved, get the YouVersion Bible app. I use something called Our Daily Bread. I've got the app for it. I've got a paper version. But listen, if you're only going to be fed on Sunday morning, you're going to be malnourished. Get with God throughout the day, every day of the week. Just take a little time to read the word. Take a little time to pray. God wants a little bit of two-way communication with you to happen every day. Amen. But he is powerful and personal. Secondly, I want us to see from this text that God is compassionate and caring. If we look at verse 37, it says this, A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, and so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I want you to notice the response 
to the events that were happening. First of all, Jesus, uh, the events that, that started to take place as they headed to the other side, Jesus told them, let's go to the other side, right? We see that first. Uh, the second thing that happens that we see in the text is that Jesus fell asleep. The third thing that we see happens is there a, gr- a great storm arose. And the fourth thing happens is the boat started filling up with water, and it was in danger of sinking. Now, those are the events. We read them, we take them at face value, right? And, and I want to back up and say this quickly. This isn't a parable. This is, I believe in my heart, a real-life event that took place at some point in time in our history. But let's notice the reaction and the responses to the developing situation. Uh, after this storm arose and the boat began filling, they thought they were going to die. Can, can we agree on that, right? They thought they were going to die. They said, Matt, don't you care that we're perishing? They woke Jesus up, and the, the, they said, don't you care that we're about to die? Let me make a point here. They went to the right person that could absolutely do something about the situation, but then they made the wrong assumption. They went to the right person in their time of need, but then they assumed that he didn't care enough to do anything about it. And we're not guilty of that, right? We, we would never let that happen. Here's some additional facts to consider. The Sea of Galilee, which is where this event took place, was a kind of a, a, and a bowl. There were mountains all around it, and the winds would come down, and, and, and the Sea of Galilee was notorious for changing weather conditions. But these were experienced fishermen that we're talking about. When he said, let's go to the other side, he wasn't getting a novice to take him to the other side. And they didn't have powered motorboats and all those things. They had sails, and they relied on the wind, and they knew how to navigate on the water. They spent their lives on the water. Surely, you would think experienced fishermen had been through some storms before. But even though they were experienced at navigating in all sorts of conditions, this storm was obviously bad enough that they thought they might not survive. How many of us who have followed Christ for quite a while, God has brought us through things before. He's brought us through things time and time again, but all of a sudden we get a new circumstance and like, oh, but God, I don't know about this one. God is compassionate and he is caring. The application here is it may seem as though God is asleep during our difficulties but he is completely aware of everything we are going through. And he cares. And he cares. Storms in our lives can arise for various reasons. I think there are at least three that I I think are relevant in growing our our faith. And this is not an exhaustive list, but three that we should consider. Storms arise because of testing. That's the application of what we already know. Now, if you think about it in terms of school, uh, and I started cringing like, I, I did all that. I'm done with school. I don't, don't bring up school, okay? But if you think about it, right, uh, when you go through math, you learn how to add and subtract. And once you're done with that, you get tested on that knowledge. And then you move on to multiplication and, and division. And when you're done with that, you get tested on that. So you can apply that knowledge as you move on to algebra and other things. And I don't think it's any different in our faith. As we grow in Christ and we learn and we go through some things and we uh, let the Lord show his glory through us, you know what? The Lord wants to keep building us, keep stretching us, and that's where testing comes in. And sometimes testing comes in the form of those storms so that we can apply the goodness we already know about God. Another reason why storms come is for spiritual growth, being stretched to learn more. How many have all the answers? Didn't think, I didn't expect anybody to raise their hand, right? Right? But it's true, we don't know all the answers. We'll have room to grow, and that's where storms also come in to teach us more about the Lord. Sometimes uh, we, we can cruise along in life, and we can get so caught up in the everyday events of our lives and doing what are we plan for ourselves and what we've got going on that we forget to acknowledge God or spend as much time with him. And sometimes God needs to get a hold of us and say, wait a minute, slow down. I want to teach you something here. And that's exactly what happens in the middle of a storm. God will allow us to be in a position that gets us on our knees, calling out to him, asking for his help. By the way, that's the position he wants us to be in anyway. The third thing and final thing, the most unpopular thing we can think of is 
discipline. Storms come for the purpose of discipline, loving correction by a father that knows best and wants what's best for us. But even experienced believers can face difficult storms and feel threatened. How trusting do we feel when no matter what you do, you and your spouse just can't come to an agreement and there's constant tension? Now, I'm just being real with you right now at this point. The next few questions that I would ask are really related to me. And if it applies to you, great. I just want us to, to get our attention and apply the word this morning. Where does our mind go when we feel like we're doing the best we can to honor God in every area of our lives, but we're challenged at every turn? We face financial difficulty. We face health issues. We face temptation. How spiritual do we feel when a brother or sister in the faith wounds us deeply? We're imperfect people. What is the perspective and outlook the person we love and care for so deeply is taken from us? How do we feel whenever our children don't seem to obey and, and we, we that won't cooperate no matter what we do? How motivated are we to keep pressing on in what God has called us when we are challenged at every turn, keep getting blown off course and can't seem to get where we think we're supposed to be going? God, I thought you said you wanted me to go over here to the other side. But why can't I get there? Those are real questions that deserve real answers. And they're real storms that can pop up in our lives. But I want you to be reminded, as we said on this point, God is compassionate. God is caring. He may seem like he's asleep, but he's completely aware of what's going on. Does your response to these kinds of things indicate a need for more spiritual growth? Lord, did I hear you wrong? I thought you wanted me to go here. Why am I having such a hard time getting there? I need you, God. Where are you? God, how could you sleep at a time like this? We may never say those things. God, don't don't you care? That's what the fishermen did, right? Didn't they say, don't you care? Didn't they say that? Don't you care? Now, we may never say that to God, but let's be real here for a minute. Doesn't our attitude or our lack of faith at times portray that we have an attitude, God, what's the use? Don't you care? John chapter 11, is a, there's a, another life event where Jesus, his best friend Lazarus, and Mary and Martha, his sisters, Lazarus was sick. They told, told Jesus Lazarus was sick. And still Jesus waited for four days to go. And, and that time, Lazarus died. And one of the sisters came up when he finally arrived and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he just wanted to point out that this was a time for God to reveal his glory in the situation. Let me tell you something. I will be honest with you and tell you, I'd rather not go through a storm of life. I've been through it. I've been you, and I'm sure that you don't think they're any more comfortable than I do. But I'm going to tell you something. Our lives are not for us. Our lives are about to bring God glory and honor. And sometimes in those storms, God teaches us things that will help us know how to do that better. Because if it's left up to me, I will fall short of the mark every time. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 15, and 16, tells us this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect, respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God is compassionate. And he is caring. The third thing I'd like to point out as we move on is that God is faithful and he's fearless. Let's look at verse 39 if we can. After they told him in verse 38, don't you care that we're perishing? And they woke him up. He, he awoke and rebuked the wind and said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. What exactly did they think that Jesus' reaction would be. Now, Jude, this is where we've got the slide. Do you have the slide ready for me? Okay, let's, let's show. Let's show that slide. Everybody recognize that, right? Kevin from Home Alone. <laughs> I mean, these guys said, don't you care that we're going to die? They woke him up. Like I said earlier, they went to the right person but had the wrong assumption. And, and I wonder if they thought that Jesus was somehow going to jump up, start running around like his hair was on fire and go, oh, no, I didn't see that one coming. Or panic and start saying, oh, you're right, we're all going to die. (sighs) 
the word tells us that Jesus got up, reprimanded the wind, and commanded the water to be calm. He wasn't surprised by the storm, and he wasn't afraid of it. He didn't have to develop an emergency action plan because he didn't have to change his plans based on the circumstances. Let me, let me say that one again. I wrote that down in my notes for the purpose. Man, it just God gave that to me. He didn't have to develop an emergency action plan because he didn't have to change his plans based on the circumstances. God is faithful. He is fearless. He's not surprised. He's not affected by our circumstances, and he doesn't panic. God doesn't feel threatened at any time. And here's the, actual, uh, the application. God is never caught off guard. He isn't surprised by our circumstances. He has a plan, and he will always respond with perfect timing. Now, we're talking about storms. We're talking about those things that arrive, arise without warning to us, but they're not without warning to God. He will respond with perfect timing, but re- be reminded here, God has never left the scene. Never. It doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome will be what we anticipate. Even if we know what the destination is, God may have a path that is different than what we planned for. We may know the will of the Lord. We may hear and know with certainty that God wants me to go to the other side. But sometimes the pathway he chooses for us is just a little bit different. He will always be there to navigate for us. The Bible tells us he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. As we said in my favorite passage in an opening, he will direct our paths if we acknowledge him and trust him in all of our ways. That doesn't mean that we always get our way in fulfilling his way. Hebrews 10.23 gives us this confidence. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. God is faithful, and he is fearless. He's not afraid of the storms. And I I just want to say that to help us to be confident this morning. I'm not trying to be generic. I'm just simply saying we can all agree that we face tough times. Remember we said, I got trouble. I, I feel like you said that with truth. I've got trouble. We will have more trouble. In this world, Jesus said, you'll you'll have trouble. It's full of tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He is faithful. He is fearless. He's never left us. He's not surprised. He doesn't panic. He doesn't get caught off guard. And he knows exactly when and how to respond to come to our aid. The final point we'd like to make this morning is God is capable and in control. Look at verse 40. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one to another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus demonstrated his capability and control in handling the situation, the reaction of the storm. What happened? Jesus got up, he spoke, and immediately the wind died down and the waves were calm. Here's a truth to take from that. A couple of verses. The creator, creator, God, got up, spoke to the creation, and the creation was at peace. If we would just understand that we, as his creation, are in the hands of an almighty creator that formed us with our uniqueness and our, our personalities and our gifts, and, our, and, and he knows our weaknesses and our imperfections, and we pray and we cry out, God, I need your help, and then all of a sudden he stands up and he says, let me give you my peace. Just a minute. He showed that he was in control the whole time. He had never lost it. The reaction of the other in the boat, they were finally, they, they saw the awe and power of Jesus They were no longer fearful of the storm, but they were fearful or in awe of the Savior and his power. The application here is that God is in control, and he can handle our trouble if we let him. That's a big if. I'm a problem solver. I like a good challenge, and I like finding a solution. Even though I don't have all the answers, sometimes I think I hold on to things a little longer than I should rather than giving some of those challenges uh, to more qualified people 
uh, to, to Saul is I see Bill here this morning. Bill's been trying to get me in for chiropractic care. I've been promising him for a long time I'm going to come see you, Dr. Bill, right? But I, I, I've been to chiropractic care, and I know what it's like when people say their back or, back's hurting or their neck's hurting. You know, I, 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 I say, hey, man, you should go see a chiropractor. But in no way, shape, or form am I going to get on, lay them down on the bed, start <laughs> doing a snap, crackle, pop on them, all right? I get it to the qualified expert. Sometimes we hold on to things way too long. We might be experienced in our faith. Maybe you're not. That's okay. But I wonder if sometimes we might be guilty of doing the right thing, that when we face a difficult situation, that, that one that like we've never faced before, we go to God and we say, God, I need your help. Lord, where are you at? Why are you sleeping at a time like this? Don't you see what I'm going through? We go to him. We ask for his help. We plead, Lord, I need you to do something. But then we're all done praying and pleading with God, and we get up from wherever we're at, and we walk away, and we drag that problem back along with us. We just need to let it go. We hang on to the problem when we leave. The Lord can bring peace into our lives, but we have to hand the control over to him. Let me just say something quickly. The word peace the idea of peace doesn't mean that everything is going to go smoothly. It does not mean that you're never going to face a storm. It just simply means that we can be confident that with God, he is in control, and God's got this. Again, say that again. God's got this. God's got this. Do you believe that? God's got this. God can't have this if I won't let go of it. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, sometimes I want the peace of God. How about you, right? I want the peace of God. But it says here in, in Philippians chapter 4 that we shouldn't be anxious about anything. Whoop, I've messed that one up already. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, oh, if I got, if, if I'm not anxious, man, you know, we're just not happy if it's hot and we're just not happy if it's cold, right? Uh, right? That's the way it goes. But God can give us his peace. Sometimes we just need to take that and say, Lord, I'm going to let go of this. I'm tired of trying to fight these sails and this wind and everything else that's causing me to be blown off course. I need you to take over. That's really what he wants anyway. As we call up the worship team for a time of response, again, I don't know how this message would have spoken to you today. It's what God has laid on my heart to share. What I do know is that we all can face difficult times. What I want us to leave here, Jesus asked this question at the very end, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? We can leave here today knowing that we can fertilize our faith and we can grow our relationship and our trust in the Lord. God wants us to be engaged and ready for both collective and personal learning. I am glad you're here today. And man, I tell you what, the older I get, I grew up in church, I am glad that we have this. I didn't appreciate it when I was younger, I sure appreciate it now. Uh, but I tell you what, it doesn't replace that personal intimate time that I have with God on a daily basis where he can talk to me and help me to understand things that are personal for me. That's the way God is. Be ready to worship and hear for, from the Lord on Sunday and develop habits that will build daily two-way communication with the Lord. God wants us to talk to him. He wants us to come to him with our needs. He knows what we have, a need, what we have need of before we ever ask him. But he wants us to talk to him, just like I want my children to come to me and say, Daddy or Uncle Tim, I, want, I need this help. I want them to be able to do that to me. But then God wants to speak to us in the same way. He doesn't want us to do all the talking. He wants to talk to us through his word. Sometimes it's word in daily devotion. Sometimes it's the word through the pastor giving us the word of God as he's been ordained to do. But we all have room to grow in our faith, 
Sometimes God allows difficult times to come by a way to help us trust him more. Listen, I want to say one thing before I hand it over. If you were here this morning and you've never taken that one most important step to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's one major difference between you and me when it comes to facing difficult times. And please don't take this in an arrogant way because I don't mean it that way. When I face difficulties, I've got the Lord who's in control of them to help me through them. But God wants that same for you. He's a powerful God. He loved the whole world, but he's personal enough that he cares everything about you. He doesn't want you to get fixed up. He doesn't want you to get through the storm and over all your imperfections before you come to him. He wants you the way you are and say, hey, let me have that. Let me take that. I can do a lot more with it than you can. When you don't know what to do, don't panic. Focus on what you do know. God is faithful. God is good. He always has perfect timing. He never sleeps. He's never caught off guard. This morning, if you're facing something that you want to give to the Lord, I encourage you in a time of response to just close your eyes where you're at. If you need to come and talk to John or me or someone after church, uh, just to talk to us. We'd be happy to pray with you. But just remember, God is always in control. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for allowing us time to worship you right now I pray for each and every person in this room I don't know what I might have said with my imperfections God I pray that you've been glorified and and that we could just speak the truth of your word and and, and Lord that has touched someone today at least help them have more confidence in such a way that their faith in you can grow God help us not to be arrogant and prideful think that we know the answers or we can fix everything because we can. And Lord, honestly, sometimes we face difficult challenges that scare even the most seasoned of believers. But we know that you love us. You care for us. You've never left us or forsaken us. You're faithful. You're fearless. You're capable of taking care of anything we bring your way. And I pray that you would do that. Whatever the uniqueness of each and every situation is here this morning, God, would you hear our prayer? And would you answer those according to your will? I pray for that person that might be here this morning that has never put their trust in you through this message. God, I pray that they would see your power and your glory to save them and give them eternal life because that's the ultimate goal. And whatever you have accomplished through this time, Lord, we want to bring you glory and honor. This I pray in your precious name. Amen.